This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. I'm Ty Forker. And joining us this week as our guest, we have composer Douglas Boyce. Douglas Boyce is uh, part of the New Music Collective Counter Induction, which is uh, releasing an album today, the day we're recording this, uh, called Group Theory. Thank you so much for joining us, Douglas. Thanks, thanks for having me. Great, it's great fun. Uh, uh, long time listener, uh, uh, first time caller. As they say. <laughs> we, we we've been thinking actually about bringing in a call in part of the show somehow. Uh, <laughs> uh, but tell that's us great. a little given bit. The, the, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, given the wide base of contemporary music listeners, you know, it might be a lot of, uh, you know. The contest would have to be like be the second caller, right? Because you couldn't yeah, you yeah. couldn't get to the the hundredth caller, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> we, I mean, we would just have thousands of people. We'd have to get so many phone lines and I know, I know. call really screeners, and it's just a mess. <laughs> Um, but so I, I'm curious about uh, counter induction. When I first read about you guys, for some reason, I guess I didn't read it very carefully, and I was under the impression that it was a a new music ensemble and it kind of is but it's it's a little bit of a a twist on that just can you just describe uh what counterinduction is well we're you know we we, hopefully we aspire to the 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 state of being a uh collective you know it's three composers and five performers and uh again i think this is I don't think it's honored in the breach more than in, in the following, but uh, we really tried to do programming as a collective. We try to do all of our planning as a collective, um, which uh, it's sort of like uh, Quakerism. You know, things can go really slow because you have to wait for everybody to uh, come together on, a, on an issue. Um, uh, which, but in the long run, I think it's it's uh, it's been very it's been a very healthy way of operating. Uh, one of the practical up, up shots, though, is that we, we've stayed very compact and very small. We have this really tight core of, uh, of a quintet of players that's a you know, piano, string trio, and clarinet, which is, uh, you know, again, aspirationally, we like to call it a new standard ensemble. There's more and more repertoire being written for it, um, but not yet tons. So one of the things we try to do is commission work specifically for that large ensemble. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, we're very interested in um, the sort of uh, uh, kind of fragmentation that can happen within this group. And so programming things where there are uh, duos and trios and, and, and uh, quartets and quintets over the course of the evening, over the course of a, of a uh, of a CD, and thus in some ways breaking away from that, you know, string quartet, let's look at the entire band all the time model. Um, I think that's one of the ways that we're counterinductive, which is a very abstract term from uh, <laughs> the philosophy of Paul Feyerabend, uh, which is uh, an, an, a very interesting critique of the notion of scientific progress. That what you think you should be doing, odds are, Fire Robin says, it's not what you should be doing. Um, <laughs> and, and the trick is, how do you figure out what you should be doing? Um, and his uh, rationale is you rely on rules of thumb. You rely on, on very uh, uh, basic rationales for decisions and not worry about the sort of prevailing theory of what's going on. Um, I think for us, one of the ways that this uh, plays out, again, not always, uh, but we're, we're very interested in situation, situating contemporary music with older music, and I don't mean that by situating contemporary practice in, uh, with traditional tonal practice by making a lot of music that sounds a lot like that. Uh, we do lots of... Uh, here's a piece from the Renaissance. Here's a here's a piece that's now. But when you when you juxtapose those two, 
it's not really the connections aren't sounding connections. They're not um, uh, surface aesthetic connections. They're hopefully something a little bit underneath the surface, um, which can mean the shows are a little uh, uh, schizophrenic sometimes. Uh, but that itself is is kind of fun and and uh, and, in, and you know it's uh, uh, hopefully uh, a little mind expanding seeing those connections that are not necessarily surface level sounding connections, but are sort of deeper deeper uh, philosophical and aesthetic connections between different different repertoires and different pieces. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of cool things that I I, I really like about counter induction. One of them. Uh, that you mentioned is that you don't stick to the whole ensemble all the time. Um, there, I mean, there's there's mixed ensembles. New music mixed ensembles are, are kind of a dime a dozen almost in 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 certain places. And uh, yeah. I I really like that you are so willing to break it down and move from that full ensemble to those smaller pieces. Um, the piece we're going to listen to today at the end of the show is just a viola sonata, it's viola and piano, and it's it's a, it's a really nice way to build in a lot of contrast, and also it, it I mean probably practically it's a nice way to uh, expand your repertoire um, very quickly um, by by not forcing you know everybody to be together all the time to 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 work up this material and put a program together. Um, well, you're, 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 you're right on the money. Um, there is a practical consideration. You know, we tend to play some terribly difficult music. <laughs> and, so, and, and I'm sure it's not your fault at all. No, 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 no. I would never do anything like that. Um, and so, you know, let's, let's, let's be blunt. Quintet rehearsals are more complicated to arrange sure. than duo rehearsals. Uh, but I, I, I think you're you're also right that it's you know it's not simply the practical uh, concerns. Oh, I should also say we have a, a, a stern rule of not repeating repertoire on performances, which it was a rule for a while. Now it's just kind of a habit, and I kind of feel like maybe it's smoking. It's like smoking. We just can't we can't quit. Uh, <laughs> which again, you sort of spend a lot of time on something, and then and then it's gone. Um, but we can talk about sort of uh, recordings and, and the relationship to that uh, later. Uh, but I think your point about color and variety, um, the even in a, a, an interesting mixed ensemble with a lot of colors, if you're just thinking about the uh, sonic possibilities of an, of an ensemble, uh, yeah, you can do all sorts of things with, say, that quintet, and you can sort of keep colors happening. But especially in a, a I feel in a concert setting, the dynamics of two people playing, uh, the sort of uh, dramatic uh, uh, tensions and relationships, and in some ways, actually, like the psychosocial relationships between these two people on stage and the audience, and who's the audience paying attention to, and why are they paying attention to that person, not that person? Yeah, um, that's very different. That's very different for a duo. Oh yeah. Than a quintet, and it's also very different for two different duos, right? Two different people. Uh, the 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 thing about trying to think about programming as a as a collective, it's not simply that it's communal decision making. It's also that you look at that individual as an individual and you think about how does this individual relate to this other individual in the, in the group. Uh, if you've met any of our uh, players or other composers, we're, you know, we're a group of kind of big personalities uh, with, that don't necessarily uh, agree instantaneously on everything. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that, that many of the performances are so dynamic and are so energetic is the, the, uh, the, the strength of conviction in all of the individuals. And when you mask that, uh, you tend to, uh, I think, um, uh, some of the different energies cancel one, an, once in the, one another out. They're sort of out of phase with one another. Sometimes they're in perfect alignment, but... Um, looking at components of it in isolation, I think, makes for a more dramatic evening, a more varied evening. Even if you came up with an hour and a half of quintet repertoire that had, uh, had you know, uh, very different sound worlds, 
that psychosocial element would be pretty similar across that concert. And so we kind of liked it. We really, that is a long way of saying it's not simply a practical question. No, I, I, yeah. And that's, it's, it certainly comes across listening to the, the whole CD that, the, even the composers within the group. So not every composer on this is CD is, is a, a counter-induction composer. Right, right, um, right. But even those that are, are really interesting contrasts to one another. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So just musically, even outside the, the contrast in, in medium is, is really interesting. I'm curious, though, about um, the, the, the thing that you said about not – repeating repertoire so you <laughs> uh, explain exactly uh, so are you do you mean that you literally don't ever do the same work on two concerts well that was when i say it used to be a rule uh it it kind of i don't know why we thought of this in our in our first couple of years <laughs> that was what we said we were we didn't like these ensembles that said you know what uh we we they, they sort of it's sort of the, the rock band um, set list yeah. model, right? And you say, hey, here's what we play. Okay, we're going here, we're going here, uh, and we're sort of playing roughly the same set list. And so we did have, for maybe it was three or four years, a rule that was we don't repeat repertoire. Then it became we don't repeat repertoire within three years of having played it, I think. Maybe it was two years of having played it. And... Uh, that's one where the, the practical downsides of that, uh, I think, win out in the end. Uh, but there's also the fact that it's kind of good to play. And to be fair, that was when we were doing run-out gigs out of New York, we would repeat repertoire. Okay. But, with, but within, like on the island of Manhattan, uh, we wouldn't repeat repertoire. <laughs> um, and I think... Again, with the, the, the idea of these uh, highly contrasting, uh, aesthetically highly contrasting programs, they, uh, you know, if you really believe in that, then repeating a, repeat, it's actually repeating a program that should be the issue, right? Because different right. pieces in different contexts signify in different ways. And so we kind of, we've kind of opened it up a little bit to that, but, um, it also, that also problematizes rehearsal schedules quite a bit. I, I well. would think. Because I, um, I, I would think that you, I mean, I feel like works do change in some ways over the course of several performances in, in oh, very much often so. good ways. And I, I wonder if you, if you would maybe be losing that. But it sounds like you yeah. kind of have struck a balance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you start something off, you have all sorts of stupid ideas about how it should be organized. <laughs> Um, and I think there was, there's a nice little truth in there, uh, but not as big as, as we thought it was. There's a strange, uh, kind of obsession with newness among, among musicians. I, I play in a Middle Eastern group named Wasaw mm -hmm. and, and we're always, you know, like there's kind of this balance between trying to find new repertoire and new pieces all the time to keep it fresh for us. But then realizing that even our, our diehard fans, you know, are only seeing yeah. us maybe three times a year. And so versus the radio where you'll hear the same songs every day, literally. Yeah. You know, we, we kind of get this idea that because we've heard it a lot of times that everyone's heard it a lot of times, which isn't really the case. Right. I, I agree. I agree completely. And I think there's a, I, I think there's a, um, um, there is something of a uh, fetishization of, of the new built into, I don't know, built, built into the fact that we're pushing a, a CD release, right? We're pushing the fact that there's this new CD that's out. And in six months, it's still going to be a great CD, right? But the idea that, well, it's the fact that it's new that is of interest it's built into funding structures, right? It's much easier to get uh, support for premieres sure. than for yeah. than for following performances or sequelae performances. And um, it's, I think it's kind of related to uh, American a, a tendency in, in America, American nonprofit structures and any and I mean corporate culture in general towards gigantism. You know, we just got even when it's not, not a good idea. Everything should be growing. The test is always, well, did you grow? Did you grow your budget? Did you? 
And uh, there's also, well, is it new? Is it new? Is it new? Well, what about those pieces we did, uh, we commissioned two years ago? Um, and we did our required three performances for that grant. Um, but if we're really committed to them, they should be as valued as much as uh, the new work. That's actually one of the ways we program this um, CD. Um, the Centora um, Marina, the, the Sherino, which I, I have to say, uh, I, it, okay, it's not my piece. It's, I think it's probably the best sounding piece on the CD. I think it's, I think it's a fabulous performance and recording. Uh, that piece, you know, for the full quintet, is actually one of the reasons we uh, we formed the we formed the ensemble. You know, wow. sort of knew this piece, and it was this amazing um, sort of experience of listening to it. And for me, that's one of the things that made me say, you know, what this this ensemble, this this uh, uh, complementation, this instrumentation, you know, this has legs. There's there's stuff to be done yeah. here. Sure. We we did the Lehigh Lab because one of our first early uh, big early performances was at, was at a, a Merkin, um, no no Merkin, the um, um, uh, Columbia um, uh, por uh, portrait uh, Miller Theater portrait concert of uh, Lehigh Lab, and just played a lot of Lee's music and got to know Lee really well and. And uh, he's just a, a great guy. And so early on, gave the ensemble a great sort of shot in the arm, a great sort of high-profile opportunity. Uh, and then Dead, Count, uh, Dead Cat Bounce, Eric Mo piece, you know, we played a bunch of Mo, uh, gotten to know him. And that piece is actually commissioned for the 10th anniversary of the ensemble. Three years ago now? Good God, three years ago now. Um, and so again, rep I think sort of represents a maturing of the organization to you know this uh, uh, to what it is organizationally and practically now. And so I think you're right. I think that CDs and thinking about these sort of digital captures, these traces of of performances, is you know, let's be honest, it's the most effective way now to make these things permanent, to make these things durable, uh, because they're just. It, Yes, I think it's a great time for new music. There's a lot of stuff. There's a, a lot of ensembles. Uh, there's still, but th there's not, and I don't think there will be the same kind of canon formation that says this piece is going to be done all over the place and everywhere. And so, in some ways, the large scale digital archiving of this repertoire, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, yes. We need to stop being worried about that thing about the canon too like it doesn't matter that the, the way the canon is formulated and what it is it has fundamentally changed we need to stop feeling bad about it and move on um anyone out there who is uh uh curious as to what happens when you institute a policy of not repeating yourself you should look at counterinduction.com slash repertoire it's a very impressive list of uh <laughs> pieces I, I, they have I, I, I actually just recently uh, turned a bunch of that off. I, I pulled a bunch of them out of the list because it was, you did, it was, it was, uh, oh, hey, there it is. There it is. It was, <laughs> it was impossible to process. It was like, there was just far too many. So that's actually become more, uh, that's the greatest hits. That's kind of becoming so the greatest So that's not hits. everything. That's just the greatest hits. So yeah. kudos, because no matter what else, I think that's a, a worthwhile um accomplishment to say we've played all these pieces which include you know some of the sort of avant-garde war horses like john cage and lots of new 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 pieces too so kudos to you and the guys and gals Thanks. i'm curious about uh how you you balance this this idea of newness with the the permanence of the cd you kind of mentioned that a, a bit ago but it's those are kind of opposite ideas is recording this thing forever and then not repeating anything ever <laughs> Well, uh, I, I think it, it, it. I think you're right that they're um, somewhat contradictory uh, trends. I, I don't think they're, uh, you know, completely incommensurate. If you think about the recording or the and the project of recording uh, as a trace of activity, you know, here right. are these things that we've done. 
And here is a, 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 a momentum. Here's a, here's a, bless you. Um, here's a, 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 in some ways it's a, you know, it's kind of, it sounds a little dark, but it's, it's kind of a memorial, right? Here's this thing that happened. And it's not the thing, but it's a, a testament or statement. To that okay. Thing. One thing, one thing we're starting now um, is, uh, and this is a kind of a plug for one of, one of our members, Ryan uh, Strieber, uh, uh, one of our composers whose who solo cello piece is on here, um, runs this fabulous studio uh, up in Yonkers, and we're going to be doing uh, sort of yearly, these are the pieces from the season that, that we want to place in, to some extent, in the common, right, in, yeah. in the public common. Uh, and we want to do that because, as you say, it's important. It sets a nice relationship between permanence and activity. And also it's because Ryan is a fabulous engineer and Ryan's studio is just a great place to do stuff. So any, anybody looking for uh, uh, an engineer and a, and a space to do stuff, uh, check out Octavian Audio. Um, uh, it's where we did this CD. Uh, it's fabulous. He's fabulous, and he's a delight to work with. So. That's the that's plug. That's the plug for the show. Excellent. No, plug away. That's that's why we like bringing new people on the show is for new plugs. Um, you guys are, are releasing this, this CD group theory today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a big yeah. event tonight? Mm-hmm. So what's, what's, Henry, what's the story with this event? Well, I mean, the hope is that it's a little bit more of a, of a, of a party than a concert. Um, so we're doing... Uh, some a bunch of shorter pieces. We're doing some repertoire from the CD, um, uh, but we're doing all and some other pieces. But we're doing um, everything. Uh, every piece is by a composer on the uh, on the CD. So we're doing Moe's Dead Cat Bounce. We're doing Fugger's Partita. We're doing Hylas Chow Manhattan. We're doing a new piece by Kyle Bartlett. Um, we're doing a new piece by Eric Stem, who I should say, uh, I didn't mention, um, he's the guy who actually runs New Dynamic Records. I'll sort of hold up the CD. Um, and, uh, it's a, they do really interesting, um, work. They, it's at, uh, Indiana University Southeast, and the, the graphic design comes from graduate students there. It's a whole nice, uh, uh, embeddedness of the of the active creation into the pedagogical goals of this university. It's great. We're, so we're playing a new piece by his, great new by him, great new kind of short piece by him, and a new piece of mine, well, an arrangement of a, of a of a piece of mine. That's actually, you know, a, a lot of improvisation. It has it's sort of uh, I don't know, um uh Zappa and Coltrane and Sun Ra hang out for a while <laughs> and this is the piece that shows up well i'm sold uh, which is okay, so it's sort of a lighter you know there's something um uh there's a little bit lighter fare for us uh which i think but i think it should be a lot of fun and uh, it's at tenry cultural institute uh in new york uh at 8 p.m all the new yorkers know exactly where that is cool uh, and the non-new yorkers are too far away so <laughs> too bad <laughs> all right um should we move on to our Let's stories. Move on. Uh, so we've got um, some some really a, an interesting project that has started just in, in is it just started this week or maybe a couple of weeks ago? Tom Service, uh, who writes for the Guardian, has decided to to start a, a blog or a series of blog posts, I suppose, uh, at the Guardian about contemporary music, and they've done a lot of these kinds of series before, um, and they have gotten some criticism that they haven't done anything like this about new music. And so this is kind of addressing that. And this is one of the first posts in this, in this, uh, series. He, he writes five myths about contemporary classical music. Um, so some of them are perhaps more mythical than others. Um, but one is that it all sounds like a squeaky gate. Uh, so Sam, this is, this is one of the, this is one of the key ones. Basically, to me, the, the first one, it all sounds like a squeaky gate is the name of the category. It's that um, 
contemporary music will have something in there that you don't like or is wrong is, is what it's getting at. And um, he doesn't really go out of his way to say that's not the case. He goes out of his way to say, well, yes, and, and that's part of what makes this new music new, but it's not a bad thing. You know, you should open yourself up to that squeak because a lot of things come from that. Um, um, I feel like that's a, lot, a trap that a lot of people fall into is is the thing that he doesn't do that you, that you, you just pointed out that when, when everybody says, or when everybody, I don't like when people say things like that. When yeah. when people say that this music is is inaccessible or sounds crazy and stuff, and everybody's like, "Well, not all of it's like that. You can listen to this stuff, and it's very pretty." Well, that's fine, but that's like a small subset, right? There's yeah. all, this whole world of stuff, and some of it sounds very difficult, and some of it sounds not very difficult. Um, and that doesn't make either of them good or bad. But I feel like in this discussion a lot of times the value of the challenging stuff is what gets lost right and and you know that he he doesn't really address this but it sort of it, it leaves people in a place where they can i mean I, this comes across as being so elitist and a ish but you know they can say they love contemporary music by um saying naming a lot of this music like you and i said yesterday dave that's merely beautiful you know i mean anybody i hate to be this way but i feel like there's tons of people that can write lyric sounding pretty music and call it new music because it was written you know in 2012 but to me the newness is that that squeaky gate part it's got to have something going for it in that aspect well you can write pretty music but it can't just be pretty music like you yeah, said yeah not if merely it, beautiful not merely beautiful there you go um, um go ahead it's inaccessible is the second uh, thing on the list. It's basically um, the same thing. Yeah, it's basically the same thing. He he uses that as a way to talk about, to fold in the idea of how um, avant-garde music and some of the technical and sort of aesthetic groundbreaking that they do in, in that field leaches its way into some of the most cutting-edge pop music, using the Beatles as an example, how John uh, Paul McCartney really liked Stockhausen. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, as pop music evolved over the years from, say, the 60s until now, tape loops and sampling and blah, 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 and all these different things that uh, were first approached as a, a, a technique by, uh, you know, early classical composers the likes of Stockhausen etc um I uh, like yeah. I like number three the best yeah number three is basically making the argument that you have to have a certain level or a certain kind of education um, I don't even know if it's education as much as it is an attitude yeah it's got to be like they're, they're saying that that you have to be it's it's very serious all the time and everybody is there's there's no levity in it ever and right. i think that's a problem for me cuz i find well, a lot of levity in very weird music sure but it it is related to education too he says you need to have a working knowledge and preferably a phd in music history to plain chant to prokofiev uh to get the music you know and so he's definitely folding the idea to me of education and like sort of a not education, but you know, well, not education in the sense that you went to school for it, but you've educated yourself. You have an understanding of this sort of like a, I guess you could say it's canonic knowledge. You got to ha have a, an understanding and an all encompassing understanding of the ca canon in some way um, to get a handle on contemporary music, which. To me, the mood, movements in contemporary music more recently, uh, I, I think, A, that's not true to begin with, and a lot of the contemporary music that's, that's uh, you know, getting a lot of traction these days is even more not that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think well, what I think this article does is it's, it's kind of taking several different angles, but it's kind of undoing some of the, the damage, if you will, by the attitudes of of classical music and art music in the 60s and 70s when when music was really fighting for its place in academia and trying to be taken seriously and trying to be, be seen as as elitist in a lot of ways to kind of earn that to earn that spot and now we realize that in doing so we've kind of alienated a lot of people and a lot of these efforts are kind of going back and trying and trying to recapture that energy and that connection that classical music used to have with the 
with the populace, if you will. Right. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm reading this, it's also a lot of stuff comes to my mind about um, communication technology. A lot of things change just because of the way content can be disseminated so fast and certainly plays a role in these considerations. Number four is... Uh, this is the irrelevant. hardest one to argue to me. It's irrelevant. Um, now, his his argument is he actually uses the term DNA, saying that and it, it's touched... A lot of these points sort of overlap on themselves yeah. quite a bit. Um, but it basically saying that, that uh, a lot of the stuff that happens in avant-garde music is sort of the DNA of what ends up being in uh, pop music, which is one saying one way of saying that it's relevant, um, and then just makes a more generic argument that, that this music does have things to say, noting the Cornelius, Cornelius Cardew, who uh, very self-consciously links compositions to um, social consciousness. Um, but you know, uh, I think that in, in contemporary art music, that's something that is hasn't happened very much at all. Um, I mean, there are some people who are doing it, but it's it's not a big part of the music. I'd say it being a contributing factor to sort of the expanding sound world that one might hear in, for lack of a better term, pop music um, is the big thing that it does. Right. I also don't know if Cornelius Cardew is necessarily the best example of contemporary music. He's, yeah. what, 30 years dead? Yeah. <laughs> um, so sometime in the 80s, I think. Anyway. Um, I also am not sure that not he keeps making these arguments in this as well as the next one. It's it's written for classical musicians, so it must be old. Uh, a lot of his arguments against these myths have to do with uh, music that relates to extra musical things. Mm -hmm. So when he's talking about Cornelius Cardew and John Adams, uh, he's talking about the relationship between their music and very specific events, and you know things like. Nixon in China and uh, Adams. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what is his 9/11 piece called? Transmigration. Transmigration. Oh, Transmigration. Transmigration souls. Souls. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of music that's just completely outside that that is still uh, important to our, you know, new music, contemporary music culture. But I, I, it's I find a, I find it hard to argue that that the music that I write is relevant to a large group of people right well, it, you know I, I think there's a, a you know the for something to be relevant or irrelevant i think the uh i i think one thing that's sort of missed in this is the fact that simply by the i don't want to sort of i don't want to be the adorno on the show but the Go for simple it. fact <laughs> but the simple fact that uh the uh that the music is different, that the music operates in different ways than popular music, say, if you're making that dichotomy, or classical concert music. The simple fact that it's organized differently opens up the possibility that there are other kinds of music making that are possible. And that's relevant because that's a critical stance in relationship to the way things are made. So to simply rely on extra musical uh, uh, relationships to justify its relevance, um, yeah, but I to me, that kind of gets gets more traditional concert music kind of off the hook. It lets it off easy uh, in a certain way. I think yeah. I remember there's a probably apocryphal story about Steve Stuckey in. And when he was in L.A., somebody came in saying, well, why do you program this hard stuff? We just want to listen to Beethoven. And he sort of said, how can you possibly not think that Beethoven is hard? Right. If you really if you really engage with it, it's doing incredibly challenging things. Right. And in some ways, the, the difficulties, quote unquote, difficulties of contemporary music set you up for that sort of uh, more engaged stance in relationship to music that seems very safe and seems very traditional. But that's me. That's me. I, I agree that, that, that um, and, and I think it's sort of suggested throughout the article, the idea of 
um, opening up new ways of operation and new ways of hearing and new ways of understanding and using music. That's something that avant-garde music to, does. But to me, um, that is a personal thing. It's going to affect you or you or you or you or whatever. But he's trying to suggest that it has more of what we associate with the idea of canon. It has more of an all-encompassing or global um, relevance, you know. And I think perhaps the days of pieces uh, being able to and or even aspiring to that from the beginning are kind of over. Um, if it has an influence, it has an influence on whoever comes in contact with it, but it's it's not going to have an influence on sort of, you know, an overarching influence. And, and it's not that music can't or shouldn't do that. I just don't think that considering how much is out there and how easily it's disseminated that a single piece can achieve that kind of mark anymore. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> New rule on Sound Notion. Anytime you talk for more than five minutes, you have to end with, but that's just me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, a lot of these issues about how uh, new music, the business that in some form or fashion we're all involved in, is received and what the public thinks about it, I think relates a lot to a new article in uh, Salon.com, No Sympathy for the Creative Class by Scott Timberg. Now, this is a, an incredibly long article. and uh, seemingly... I think it's awesome that there are, there are, are publications like Salon.com and, and The New Yorker that, that let – their writers spend the time to to create these really in-depth uh pieces about kind of fringe issues uh or, or at least unexpected important issues um so i i, I mean it's it's absolutely worth the read i i read it all this morning and it's it's really good all the way through um but we understand if if you don't want to it is unexpected when you you get so used to kind of the the internet length of articles yeah yeah and and i just started browsing through this one this morning as well and i'm watching my my scroll bar on the right side that's exactly and, and i feel like i've been reading for a long time and i'm like holy cow i'm only halfway down this screen <laughs> so it, it is a really interesting article so yeah. what so what is it sam well uh, the 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 basic argument is that um We've had an economic downturn recently. It's affected everybody. It's affected people in the – like cultural – people who are the cultural manufacturers, if you will. It's affected everyone, including those people. Um, but uh, if you think, um, okay, here's there's, there's a bricklayer who's out of business, who's out of work because you know housing has been hit by the economic downturn. That's awful, and I feel sorry for that guy's family, et cetera, et cetera. People don't feel sorry for people who are – you know, create cultural products when they're out of work. It's like, well, of course you're out of work. What you do is useless. It's kind of the attitude that people get. There's a great quote in here where it says it talks about how both liberals, uh, to, to stereotype a little bit, say the liberal and the conservative um, side of the argument considers this person. Here it is. A working artist is seen neither as the salt of the earth by the left nor as a job creator by the right but as a kind of self-indulgent parasite by both sides. And certainly that's not true in all instances, but I can attest that, that that's true a little all the time as a, you know, as a self-indulgent parasite myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a problem that uh, it kind of addressed by, as you said, uh, this, this Tom service piece in that this is a relevant thing and a valuable thing, though it's hard to necessarily quantify the value. It is it is worth caring about, and I think another thing that this Salon article points out is that you know when people think about artists and art, the thing that pops into their head or the creative he keeps using the term creative class. Uh, the thing that pops into their head the most are the things that they see in on the magazine stands and on television they see actors that are making millions of dollars for uh a, you know a, a movie that that they make and they make you know one movie every three years and they live in in ha in four houses that are nicer than one of anyone else's right and um they kind of impute that same culture to 
this whole class of people that are that create creative product that make creative products um when in fact there are a lot of people that are just um slogging work a day kind of you know journeyman violinists that you know there's and in fact this this article uh cites uh, one particular violinist in southern california that's just you know gig 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 all day long teaching teach in the mornings and afternoons and then go play another gig and it, you know it's 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 a lot of work just like any other job is a lot of work and i feel that's um something that uh also kind of goes hand in hand with the the de romanticization the de mystification of uh creating art when when yeah. making something becomes less of this magical inspirational spiritual experience and really just you know ha hammer and hammer and nail uh and kind of well not exactly hammer and nail but somewhere in between the two where where there's there's uh kind of a middle ground um and these people really do work hard and it just it, at the same time i think one of the reasons this this article appeals to us is like yeah we do work hard we're not <laughs> parasites and maybe this is not something that other people would read the same way we do right but it sure makes us feel good <laughs> one aspect go ahead ty oh i was just gonna say one thing it doesn't address very well is just the the purely economic points of it like maybe there is this you know hidden you know feelings against the the creative class but at the same time if, if everything in the economy is not great and people are not making, you know, car payments. They're certainly not going to go see an orchestra with their money, and they're, you know, and they're not going to go see a new music group or, you know, go out for dinner where a jazz quartet's playing. Yeah. So, you know, it's. I don't think there's always an attitude against it. It's just a reality of the current economic situation. Well, I think that kind of speaks a little bit to the special place that music holds. You know, music and photography are the two things that people think should be free and that people that do them want to do them for free, um, having experience in both fields. Um, one, ex one thing that I think is, is not directly addressed in this article, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, is certainly the, the things, uh, you know, the creative class has suffered from the economic downturn and you're creating products and people are buying less products, of course, but... There's also a special relationship between um, many modes of creativity currently and the power of crowdsourcing and the fact that everybody has access to the ability to create lots of things. Uh, taking photography as an example is the easiest example, you know. Saying you're a professional photographer now means like uh, nothing to what it would have meant if you said that in an honest way and say 1983, you know. Everybody's a professional photographer. The, uh, the people who generate and sell images, are, the, the way they do business has completely changed because there are millions of people that generate perfectly acceptable images and put them up for free or for cheap. So it's changed the whole dynamic of that field, and, and it's no different in music, you know. Um, so that, that, not just the economic downturn, but just the, the power of crowdsourcing for creating creative products has an effect on the people who consider themselves, quote, and, and the commodification of creative work is, I think, right. what you're talking about. Right. So, you know, uh, also this that's week. Just what you, that's just you, right? That's just, that's you. just me. <laughs> and this is also just me. I can't confirm it, but the American Composers uh, Orchestra announces its 21st <laughs> annual Underwood New Music Readings. Um, this is a very cool project, uh, and, and it's 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 great that they that they do this, and it's for, usually, for young younger composers usually. Um, and it's not really a performance; it's just kind of an open rehearsal and an open run through on consecutive nights. Um, but the thing that I thought was particularly interesting about this, and I don't know if they've done this before, this was news to me. The winning composer, I didn't realize it was a contest, will be commissioned to compose an original mobile phone ringtone that will be made available free of charge to everyone who voted. I so, would be... Go ahead, oh, If I'm reading this correctly, there's kind of, there's two separate competitions. Uh, one, one composer will be awarded a, a big time Commission, a commission like for the yeah, fifteen thousand bones, baby. But the ringtone contest, <laughs> I think, is a separate thing where attendees will will vote via text message. I presume, of course, 
and then and then they'll they'll be the ones the voters are the ones who will get the ringtone the commissioned ringtone mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a fan's choice versus okay. the the artist's choice yeah so you I, know, I knew about the 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 uh the orchestra choosing somebody to commission i didn't know about the the ringtone thing you know, it's weird. I would feel more comfortable getting fifteen thousand dollars to then write an orchestral piece that's quote worth fifteen thousand dollars. That would be a lot less stressful to me than coming up with a, a ringtone that works and is cool, but it's still just a ringtone. <laughs> to me, that sounds harder. <laughs> let's let's do it. Let's make some. <laughs> the first first annual Sound Notion ringtone contest. Oh, that's I, so good. Let's do that, it. That rings Let's, like gold, baby. That, oh man, we're doing that. We're doing that, Ty. We'll have, yeah. we'll have a little meeting after the show. Sure. We, we, uh, that that uh, is the way to go. Yeah. Also, be sure you're practicing your uh, your piano chops because, of course, Make Music New York is coming back this summer, uh, and and there are going to be again the 88 pianos all over uh, the five boroughs. So make sure you you've got your your piano chops worked up so you can. Uh, have your own little impromptu piano recital at, at any of those 88 pianos all over all over the sidewalk um very cool project and there are tons of really compelling sounding uh performances on the program you can check out their their website for for the full program it's a great mashup of, of um people from all different musical styles uh and a lot of open public performances that you know just putting putting music in in your everyday environment a lot of fun uh sam you're gonna you're gonna have to take the occupy guitar me i can't do this all right it's not it's not incredibly clear exactly what this thing is but um (laughs) occupy guitar me as in the word guitar with army put on the end of it um, what it looks like to me is it's going to be like a mass parade. There's a map of the places that they're going to march or something. So it's like a bunch of as many people as possible going around with an acoustic guitar strumming. And I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of score. There's a checklist of things you should bring, um, an acoustic instrument, because NYC prohibits the use of amplifiers in public without permit, which is an interesting fact. Um, a tuner, so everybody can get in tune. So we're going to be doing some. Yeah, that'll happen. Temp- we're, we're doing some equally tempered uh, A440 stuff. Um, uh, two extra sets of strings. So apparently, this is going to be a, a marathon. Um, wire cutters and needle nose pliers for replacing strings, et cetera, and everything else that you would need to march around playing a guitar. But a special announcement: the Occupy Guitar Army now has an instrument medic, medic core. So when when you have a breakdown, you just scream for a medic, and someone will come and slap some new strings on your guitar. Oh, so that, I think that's all there is to say about it. But I'm interested to see if it if it works, and we have thousands of acoustic guitar people strumming around, walking around in uh, Bryant Park. Um, I hope there is some video, which I'm if it works and it happens, I'm pretty sure there will be some video. So um, if you're out there and you sh- and you plan on shooting video, be sure to send us a link at uh, Sound Notion. Sam, I got a present for you. Okay. It's it goes like this. Make sure you play long enough till the till the vocals come in. Yeah. That is your favorite kind of stuff, right, Sam? Yes. That's just your favorite. That's actually not music of the 18th century there at the end. Uh, that was written by Kevin Putz and uh, the opening of uh, his, his opera Silent Night uh, based on the, the film Joyeux Noël that just won a Pulitzer a couple weeks ago. And you can stream the whole thing for free at NPR Music. And it does not all sound like it's from the 18th century, I promise. Yeah, so that's two years in a row now, and opera is one. And you know, based on that, <laughs> we can only assume that the Minnesota Opera uh, is going to go out of business this year, just like Opera Boston did last year. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, after they're premiering doomed. this work. 
yeah, so uh, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the piece from what I've listened so far. Well, you should listen to some more and give it a chance. Okay, I will. Uh, if I listen to the Philip Glass Symphony Nine all the way through four times, then you know I can stand listening to this. There you go. Um, also, the Louisville Orchestra may not be in, uh, in going away forever after all. Uh, remember a couple of weeks ago, we said that the musicians said, hey, we're really close to hammering out this one-year bridge deal, and then we're going to work out a new deal after that. Uh, and the orchestra said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard anything about this in my life. And, well, turns out uh, that's exactly what happened <laughs> this last week. It was just announced that uh, the the Louisville Orchestra what is it, the LOI, Louisville Orchestra Incorporated, the, the management and Louisville Orchestra musicians have reached a an agreement for a one-year deal during which they will work on a more permanent deal. I believe their season um, is going to be uh, shortened-ish, 30 weeks, starting around September. Um, and uh, they'll, they're going to enter some kind of arbitration. It's They use the word binding arbitration, but then they also use the word recommendation, which are two things that don't go together, really. Um, and that's that's something that, uh, of course, Drew McManus pointed out on his excellent Adaptation blog. You should read any of your orchestra news there at adaptation.com um, because he's the only one that gets it right. Uh, Friend of the show. Here, here, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you read Adaptation? Oh, God, yeah. He, he, he knows his stuff. He does indeed, and he's careful. Yes. Yes. Yes, he reads. That's, that's, that's it. It's not even really knowing your stuff. It's are you careful, mm-hmm. and it, it, it he he drills down. It's great. Yeah, yep. best best news and analysis in the biz. Um, this last one is a study. Sam, do you want to take the study? Um, a study in the UK. Now, this is not going to come to so, as a surprise to a lot of people, but a study, and and albeit this is a fairly small study, um, it only included. Uh, 52 girls and boys, they don't give a gender breakdown. Um, but basically, it's a study that has an initially shows that um, um, making music together, communally, mu- communal music making makes kids more empathetic than uh, not just not doing something, but actual uh, exercises designed to encourage the establishment of empathy or to encourage empathetic feelings in in people but do not use music um in the experimental group they did exercises where basically you're playing together and figuring out how to make music happen but it, the communication if you will is happening with your instruments and in the other two there were two other control groups and uh they involved different media types but they did not involve music but they were specifically designed to encourage feelings of empathy and in in compared to both control groups the group of kids that were using instruments as sort of the mode of communication um tend tended to uh develop more feelings of empathy and uh to uh, to develop in uh that is the empathy in this case is they're talking about it as a key component of what is termed emotional intelligence, which I'm not going to get into a breakdown of what that means, but you can read all about it on the internet and you've probably heard some about it. Um, but I don't think this is surprising at all. It's um, not, but I think it's important for us to be able to show, you know, em- empirical evidence of things that we find to be intuitive. Uh, and this is one of them. Absolutely. Uh, so I think we should move on to our, our pick of the week. Do you think? Sam doesn't have his drop ready because Sam just moved house yesterday. Yeah, Um, that was my artificial reverb. We'll get back to it next (laughs) week, promise. Um, So our pick of the week this week is by our guest, Douglas Boyce, uh, performed uh, on this new CD, uh, the new counterinduction CD, Group Theory. And uh, it's a it's viola sonata, not for viola and piano. Do you want to maybe set up uh, the the recording that we're going to listen to? Douglas? Um, yeah, great. Uh, it's a piece uh, sort of came about when Jessica Meyer, the, the, the CI violist, uh, kept saying, uh, actually, one of, one of the first ideas for counter reduction, Jessica and I started this whole thing. She kept saying, you should write me a piece, you know, that's a real showcase for me that does these things, it's multi-movement, 
the uh, you know the, the lyrical interior movement. There's and I kept saying, so you, so you want a viola sonata? She said, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't want to be a sonata. And then she would list all of the significant features of a sonata. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then it didn't get written. It didn't get written. Other things were happening uh, along the way. And so this is another one for the 10th anniversary that I finally said, you know what? Um, here you go. Here's the piece. Um, and it has this very fancy pants title, as I tend to do. Uh, and Dexo is uh, uh, in, 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 in ancient Greek. It's an argument and it's the a sort of a logical argument, and it's the performance of, of that argument. Um, it's both the, the, the structure and the, the act of speaking, uh, of articulating that structure. And so it struck me that that's kind of, you know, this is what we're talking about. It's I'm sort of generating these structures, and then she's going out and sort of speaking these structures. Um, there's a fair amount of, uh, of, uh, of open form, you know, Lusovsky and frame notation kind of stuff in it, uh, but not too much. Uh, and it's definitely, uh, she said she wanted something uh, kind of hard and uh, that sort of shows off her chops. Uh, and it sounds pretty it hard. Does. And, it, and, she, and, she, and she plays it great. And so it has some of that sort of uh, bravura, um, <clears throat> You know, uh, 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 of the sort of you know that, that role of sonata, both as a intellectually compositionally serious piece, and for the performer, uh, uh, a weighty uh, work. I think the piece, we're, the bit we're going to hear, is from the first movement. Yes. Um, which is, uh, it's sort of coming into the recapitulation because it does all the things. I, I, it, it. You know, there's a there's a first thing group, there's a second thing group, there's a core, there's a development collection, um, and so we're coming sort of to the end of of uh, the development, right into the recap, and so it follows that that classical model of rising energy uh, into the recap, uh, whether or not uh, it sounds like music from the 18th century. Uh, uh, I'll leave that up to you guys uh, <laughs> to say. Uh, but it's a great piece, and I should say that the CD uh, I checked, and the uh, it is available online at newdynamicrecords.com. Uh, it's the engine is going. You can buy it by MP3. You can buy it, you can buy this physical copies, and as you might expect, we'll be selling copies at the uh, party tonight. Um, so I hope anybody who can make it makes it. All right. Well, uh, let's let's take a listen. This is uh, Dexo Sonata for Viola and Piano, performed by Jessica Meyer, written by our guest today, Douglas Boyce. <laughs> So that was an excerpt from Dexo, Sonata for Viola and Piano by our guest Douglas Boyce. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's a really, really cool piece, Douglas. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's great to sort of be on the air, air or the on the interwebs with you guys. Um, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, when I first heard this piece, before I knew anything uh, about it, I, in fact, the first thing I, I thought was that it sounded very antagonistic. Uh, between the viola and the <laughs> piano, and perhaps the composer and the viola, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I like the idea of of the 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 kind of play playing out of an argument as as you describe earlier. Uh, is, is, I think it fits the piece beautifully, and and uh, the performance is fantastic. This is a really yeah. great performance. Get, 
Jess is amazing, and Steve Beck, as we all know, is just he's a bear and a half of a piano player. I mean, it's just it's uh, he's something. He's something. Yeah, um, it very it very much makes me think about the discussion we had earlier about um, programming concerts and and mixing it up between smaller and larger groups. When you listen to this, and you mentioned it yourself, and and Dr. Uh, Lorenz, not Lorenz, Dr. Uh, Abril, for my undergraduate, would be happy I'm bringing it up. The the sense of bravura you get, um, you can have sort of an arrangement of this for a quintet, but you don't feel the same when you're watching that one violist sort of struggle, you know, yeah. her way through these. Especially you know, the string instrument, such a visual thing. Yeah, yeah. So like you really get a lot of empathy, I think, from the audience when you've got music that sounds like it's, you know, resolving this tension, and then you get to watch them sawing the thing in half as they're doing it. It really creates an impact yeah. concert, absolutely. Yeah, I agree, um, I agree. Yeah. Even in that small segment we just listened to, there it's it's a really nice treatment uh, as far as the, the development and the exchange of motives, and it does sound, uh, if I can say this, you know, in that traditional sonata, vain but without sounding old-fashioned like it sounds really fresh but you really hear that exchange of ideas clearly yeah i, I would put that, that, that was the plan so thanks yeah. <laughs> that was the yeah. plan kind of like what ty said it's like to me the the sonatiness of it i mean i didn't bother trying to hear the overall arch or anything but it's the it's it's the clarity, if that makes sense. Like uh, I was thinking about Colin Holter's article from New Music Box last week where he's saying goodbye, and he's talking about um, struggling with uh, perceptibility, like what is perceptible to the audience, and you sometimes miscalculate that. To me, yep. the job of Sonata, one of the jobs is to make, you know, everything is perceptible. It's sort of like a right there presentation, like, you know, I'm not trying to fool you or anything. This viola player is going to get up here and she's going to do it and do it hard for five minutes or whatever. And uh, that's right. a refreshing thing. Well, no, I think and I think your point about um, what's essentially, you know, sort of actorialization of, of how does the audience say this is something that's significant to me. I was teaching a form class last semester and uh, – I kept trying to instill in them the idea that uh, they would ask, you know, well, what's a theme? Is that a theme? What's not a theme? Yeah, it's, and, it's something tr watch, tricky watch for it. kids to pick up because not, not every yeah. tune is a theme and not every little fragment of a thing is a motive. It has to do with the way it's used. Right. Exactly, and what I kept saying to them was a theme is whatever the composer manages to treat like a theme and convince you that it's a theme. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it can be cloud music. And if yes. it, it just behaves as if it has a thematic function, a thematic role, guess what? It wins. Yeah. It's a theme. Right. And, and, but again, I think in this case, the clarity of that thematic material allows for those kinds of exchanges, which I think powers the kind of... Um, dynamic between the two players right and, and, and if i may pay you just one more compliment another thing i really like about the sonata uh, on the whole in the in the, the the three movements that make it up um is that there's this, a really nice i think you strike a really nice balance between contrast and variety and cohesion so many times i listen to multi-movement works especially recent multi-movement works and it's just this suite of relatively unrelated things and they could just as easily be taken apart and played elsewhere. And I feel like there's uh, more that ties this uh, together as, as one work um, without making it sound like one extended m movement. And it and certainly never never wears out uh, its welcome. But it, it's, it's, like I said, it's just a really nice balance between uh, familiarity and variety. Great. Thank, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Again, um, that was that. Of course, now that you say that, I'm going to say that was the plan all along. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll assume that it was. <laughs> um, so I think we should probably wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us, Douglas. Do you have any, any other things besides the show tonight that you want to plug that you have coming up? Uh, I've got a performance down in Charlottesville of a, of a kind of bizarre ornithology-based piece with a painter and an installed electronics around sound thing. Very uh, cool. 
uh, which should be fun, and hopefully that'll be coming up to New York next year, working on the details. Excellent. Uh, of that. So anybody down in uh, in Virginia, come out for that. Um, uh, but mostly just thanks for thanks for having me on. Uh, I think uh, it's a, it's a, a pleasure and an honor. I think you, it's this is great fun, and I think it's doing a lot of good. Uh, you guys getting together every Sunday morning doing this. Well, thank you so thanks. much. We're, we're, we really appreciate that. Um, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you also to Ty for filling in on very short notice. Uh, Ty, After giving a great recital last night. Yes, Ty, yeah. as of yesterday, is Dr. Forker uh, giving his last lecture recital. And then at the bar afterwards, I said, hey, Ty, what are you doing tomorrow morning? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us on short notice, Ty. Uh, you're welcome. As as always, it's, it's great to be on and hang out with you guys. All right. We record this show every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern Time. So anybody that's interested, you can watch us live uh, at soundnotion.tv slash live and join us in the chat room. Uh, we're, we're always watching there. If you have any questions for our guests that, that we missed, you can you can share them with us there and we'll ask them right then. Um, so you can be a part of the show as well. If you're watching this or listening to this after the fact and you'd still like to be a part of this conversation, you can head on over to soundnotion.tv slash SN, the website for this show, and leave us a note there. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. Um, this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV are available in the iTunes Store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. And uh, be sure to subscribe there so you can catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo, Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.